right. Hello, good afternoon. Good morning, everyone. My name is Courtney Dogger, and I am the president of Network 2020. We are an inclusive international community, and we're really focused on bridging the gap between the private sector and the international affairs community. We work through a lot of different educational programs like this virtual briefing series. We also do deep dives on countries. Uh, we also have some research and impact programs, including um, a fellowship for young entrepreneurs from Bosnia. That was an outgrowth of one of our research programs. So we're doing a lot of different work in a lot of different parts of the world. So please do check us out on social media. Um, if you like this briefing, please do subscribe to our YouTube channel where you can find more such briefings as well. Um, so with that, welcome. Welcome to Dr. Abbas Malani. Um, it really is an honor to have him here today. Uh, his bio is up on the screen, but what I wanted to do instead of reading his bio is just um, to, to point out a few facts about him, um, including um, reading this quote that I, that I found in an article from 2010, where uh, they write, his books, articles, television appearances, and contacts inside Iran have made him a household name there and thrust him squarely into the struggle for the country's political future. So um, we are really incredibly lucky to have him today. Um, and so thank you so much. And Brian will be putting information about his books in the chat so you can also um, learn more about that there. So thank you and welcome Dr. Malani. It's really, again, an honor to have you here. Thank you. So um, Iran, I mean, it's, it has been in the news for, for quite some time um, recently, but, you know, as, you know, just trying to put some of what's happening in perspective, major anti-corruption and economic protests have been taking place in Iran since 2018. Um, and, you know, with that in mind, you know, you'd mentioned in a recent CNN interview that, that the people of Iran don't believe that this regime can reform and that they want a new social contract. Um, you know, what are some of the key reasons that, that you think has led to this state of affairs um, and, you know, is really driving where Iran is headed today. You know, so if you could just kind of give us some context to, so that we, we can understand the, the movements. Thank you very much. Yes, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I, I think uh, the contract that Mr. Khomeini, the founder of the Islamic Republic, uh, made very clear uh, contract with the Iranian people when he was in exile, was that he was going to come back to Iran and create a, the democratic republic. Once he came to Iran from his exile, he created a clerical despotism where the foundational idea, literally and theoretically, is that people are incapable of making their own decisions and they need a guardian. And the quote he gives is like a woman uh, and a child who needs a guardian. Uh, the people never signed to that contract and have been, in a sense, trying to fight for 44 years to convince the clerical regime that you have breached your contract with us and we want what we fought for. Secondly, Mr. Khomeini in Paris promised clearly that he is not going to force women to wear the hijab. Once he came back, he breached that contract as well, and women began to fight for. 43 years. So this is not an unexpected explosion. This is the gradual grind of breaches of a contract with the people and endemic corruption, increasing despotism, increasing personal use of power by Mr. Khamenei and his cronies to the detriment of the uh, Iranian people and to the detriment of Iranian women. Thank you. Um, out of curiosity, you know, where was that shift from when he came back um, from exile? Was that something that, you know, many people saw coming or, or was it the, this, the system that he, he created? Did it force it in that direction? Because I, I find it an interesting switch. It is a, a few people did find it, uh, did uh, expect it and actually wrote about it. A gentleman, 
called Mustafa Rahimi, a brilliant uh, jurist, uh, wrote an open letter at that time to Mr. Khomeini saying that uh, if you're going to mix politics and religion, you're going to get despotism, not a republic. Uh, you cannot have a religious republic that is democratic, uh, because as Hannah Arendt famously said, you know, democracy is based on the notion that there are ambiguities in human problems, and none of us have the final answer. And religion always claims to have the final answer and the clear solution. And religion in the version that Khomeini advocated indicates that he and his successor are the direct representatives of God on earth. So there, some people saw it, but revolutions are uh, moments of uh, national euphoria. They're uh, like a, a carnival. Voices of reason often get uh, silenced by uh, voices of passion, and that's what happened. Uh, but as soon as Khomeini began to show his real color uh, and began to implement these uh, draconian, in my view, uh, medieval uh, uh, programs, people began to uh, protest. Uh, I was teaching in Iran at the time. Uh, I taught at Tehran University Faculty of Law and Political Science. They changed the judicial system that Iran had for almost 70 years from a democratic, secular, uh, modern system uh, to a medieval system where you cut up the hands of a thief, when you stone uh, the uh, a, a, a adulterer, when the life of a woman is literally worth half of the life of a man. And we protested. We said this is a profound step backward. And out of 45 members of the faculty, they threw 40 of us out for signing that petition and a couple of other petitions against torture. So uh, there was protest. There was some wiser heads who saw what was coming. Uh, there was a woman who wrote a very open letter, very defined open letter, uh, Mashida Amishai, a very famous writer. Uh, several other people wrote, but the dominant discourse was the euphoria. Uh, that this is something is, uh, remarkable. And the Iranians were not incidentally the only ones who made that error. Uh, Western intellectuals who came to Iran, one of the most famous intellectuals at the time, Michel Foucault came to Iran. Uh, he knew nothing about Iran. Uh, he learned even less when he was there, um, but he began to embrace this revolution as something profoundly uh, new, as something that is revolutionary against capitalism and against socialism. Some of the progressives in this country, from Chomsky to others, began to embrace it as an anti-imperialist, anti-Zionist, whatever discourse they used. So there was a lot of romance. Uh, some people saw him as a mystic. He's going to go back to his uh, studies and uh, leave politics to politicians. All of these, all of them, were false, profoundly uh, mistaken notions. Thank you. Um, so you emphasize a lot about the importance of democracy um, in Iran as a really critical tool for saving and shaping the future of Iran, and that this is, you know, not Iran's first attempt at democracy. And so, um, you know, going back to the 1979 revolution, you know, which in some respects was a direct response to um, the Shah's more liberal views. You know, do you think that there might be, um, you know, any backlash right now that, that could have severe consequences for Iran's efforts to uh, change? You know, um, my understanding of uh, the Iranian quest for democracy uh, is that it is a Sisyphean struggle, like the myth of Sisyphus whose uh, punishment was to roll it, the stone up a hill. And every time he rolled it up, it would roll back down. But I like the interpretation that Albert Camus gives, that it doesn't roll all the way back down. It stays a little higher. And that, to me, is absolutely the story that has happened to democracy in Iran. The first time we have an Iranian woman uh, take off her veil, and give a talk, public talk, is almost 150 years ago. It's two years before Seneca Falls. Two years before Seneca Falls, a woman called Horatolain gets up and delivers a sermon 
takes off her veil. It's a sermon for a Bobby movement. It's a relig new religious movement. And people in the audience who are her co-religionists are so taken by this that one of them takes a throat a knife to his own throat. The other one tries to take a knife to her throat. Now, Iranian women, 150 years ago, are taking off their veil and men are joining in the celebration and supporting it. And the call for this movement is woman, life, and liberty. So there has been a lot of backlashes, a lot of uh, patriotism, pa patriotic uh, uh, backlash, men reasserting their uh, authority, quote unquote, but women and the quest for democracy, uh, in spite of these uh, steps backward, has been historically, gradually, inexorably moving to this moment, which is the most democratic moment, I think, in the last 150 year history of Iran. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. And, and I think, so, you know, I went to Iran in 2014 as a part of a Network 2020 trip. It was sponsored by, by the government. I mean, we, we paid our own way, but it, we had to have permission from the authorities. But even at that time, it was interesting to see how um, just how there seems to be a meshing of this idea of democratic um, values and, and we could even feel it even under this this government sanctioned trip and so i'd be curious just to hear you know your take on what i mean th there's clearly a range of views in any society right um and and i think within the united states we tend to look at iran and see really only one side of things but if you know because our audience is largely american you know what would what would you say to people in terms of um, just to describe what that sentiment is in Iran and the fact that you you believe so strongly in this in this democratic society? Um, you know what what are the different influences from those who are on the very democratic side, and what did they have to contend with on the other side? Uh, you know, because uh, we, we are short of time, I'm going to refer to two things, uh, and then I'll offer an explanation. Uh, I, I gave a Stanford TED talk called "The Paradox of." Persia, where I describe why there is this paradox in modern Iran, where you have a dour, uh, chauvinistic uh, patriarchy, and underneath it, there pulsates a society that thinks differently, behaves differently, dresses differently, has different values. Uh, in, the Atlantic, uh, in the Atlantic, I wrote an article called the Iran's Incre uh, Incremental Revolution. And I then said, a revolution has happened in Iran. People are living lives profoundly different than what the regime wants. Their values are different. Iranian women do not tolerate this misogyny. They live their life according to what they think their worth is, not what this regime thinks. So uh, all of these, uh, the level of uh, acceptance of uh, the women's movement, the level of acceptance of plurality of religion, uh, 60 years ago, uh, many, many of Iran's top secular intellectuals were never supportive of religious minorities like the Baha'is. Now, a bulk of them are coming out and saying, shame on us for not having supported. You have the right to live. Uh, on the whole plethora of issues, you see clear evidence from polls to anecdotal evidence, to the number of women in the public domain, to what's written in the public domain, to the sophistication of the discourse of uh, people. You see that society has matured. That Sisyphean struggle has continued. Uh, our current uh, uh, activists, uh, one of the characteristics of their democracy, their democratic inclination, is that they don't accept a leader like Khomeini uh, that our generation accepted 44 years ago. Accepting a charismatic leader is a sign of a failure of democracy. Uh, Bertolt Brecht famously said, uh, pity a nation that needs a charismatic hero. Now people are organizing in networks and, and women have a leading role in that. And a remarkable number of people are averse to the idea that we need a messiah. You know, one of the great 
uh, creations of Iranian culture is the notion of a messiah. It comes from a Zoroastrian tradition where somebody will come and save us in a millennium ahead. Now, people literally are saying, we ourselves are the messiah. Neither the clergy, nor the left, nor the intellectuals, nor American Marines, nor British paratroopers, we ourselves are the saviors. We don't need a messiah. Keep your messiahs for your prayers at night. Leave us be and let us uh, create a better future for ourselves. Thank you for that. Um, you wrote in 2015 in your article, The Authoritarian Resurgence, that the regime's authoritarianism is more flexible and durable than some of its quixotic detractors hope, and yet more fragile and endangered than its invested defenders suggest, um, which I think is such a brilliant way of capturing that, that tension. Um, how relevant do you think that assertion is today in the context of Iran's social political landscape, considering the current government? I, I don't think I could have put it better uh, today. I really mean that. Uh, this regime is far, far, far more fragile than Khamenei pretends. But it is far, far more still ensconced than his quixotic uh, uh, detractors thing. This is not a regime that is going to fall tomorrow. Uh, this is a regime that is still has a few million supporters. And it is a regime that has absolutely no compunction to use that to slaughter thousands if need be. This is not the Shah's regime. When the Shah thought that the people don't want him, and when he thought that the US and Britain no longer support him, he decided to leave. Khamenei will turn Iran, if he can, absolutely into another Syria. Khamenei in Iran were, with the help of Russia, instrumental in destroying Syria to serve, to save Assad. And they have more than once said, we'll destroy Iran in order to keep ourselves. And they have said, and just recently, three days ago, uh, they brought units of Hashd al-Shabi, the radical Shiites of Iraq, and uh, marched on the borders of Iran. The clear message being, if we can't control it ourselves, we're going to bring Hezbollah, and we're going to bring uh, Hashd al-Shabi both of whom have been created with help from Iran. So they will use everything. But if they think they can use force to survive, they are quixotic. This regime, to me, is dead. It's a corpse. But corpses sometimes have poison. Corps, cor corpses sometimes have a shadow they cast. This is like that shadow. And uh, its power of poison is much more than the people who think they're going to get on a plane tomorrow and go back and take over the country uh, are, I think, miscalculating. Thank you. you. You mentioned in that answer a few um, of the other actors, the fact that Iran exists in a greater context. Uh, you mentioned the US, the UK, um, also even Russia. I'd love to get to some of these other relationships. And just because we're in the US, starting with the US one, which has obviously been turbulent between the US and Iran for several generations. Um, and there are some who advocate for a more forceful approach to the regime. I think we were talking earlier about you know, uh, some of the Trump administration's missives. Um, there are others that say that it would be counterproductive. And you know, Network 2020, just for full disclosure, you know, we've been very pro-engagement in the past. We've been pro-dialogue. We've met with former Foreign Minister Zarif. We've met with top Iranian UN officials where we were very um, pro-dialogue, especially leading up to the JCPOA. In your mind, what is the best approach for the United States uh, to take with Iran at this time? And how has that changed over time? Well, first of all, I too was uh, in favor of uh, the nuclear deal. Uh, I thought it had flaws. Uh, I thought at that time that the Obama administration should have emphasized the human rights issues. I thought they should have uh, at least negotiated on the regime's uh, regional uh, ambitions. Uh, but I thought having the deal was far better than not having the deal. Uh, I have never been in favor of not talking to the Iranian regime. That's not a policy. That's a failure of policy. But it's important what you negotiate. 
and when and how you negotiate and when and how you uh, send signals. Uh, in 2015, uh, a nuclear deal was uh, the least bad option. Right now, uh, the way the Biden administration seems to behave to me is the worst of all possible worlds. Uh, they are not sending the right message to the Iranian people. And uh, uh, I have to also say, preface this, uh, it's not preface, it's mid-face, uh, that uh, I absolutely don't believe the U.S. has any right to interfere in the political affairs of Iran. The future of Iran has to be determined by the people of Iran the United States, England, Israel, France, Austria, Vienna, whoever, they have no role to play. But they also have a moral responsibility not to support an oppressive regime when it is in the business of killing its people. And furthermore, I mean, you can even argue that even the regime, uh, if the regime is killing its people, uh, the nuclear deal is so important that we will overlook that in favor of uh, averting a bigger danger, which is the danger of a nuclear Iran. I absolutely believe on that issue, the cat is out of the bag. Iran has every piece in place to have the breakout. And I would be very surprised if uh, this regime in the next few months uh, does not openly declare that they're, they have gone for the bomb. They are very much more than ever before I can say this categorically, more than ever before, officials close to Khomeini, officials in the parliament are talking about why not the bomb. A, a official very close to Khomeini's office, uh, one of his uh, security advisors, just four days ago said uh, uh, to the base, he said, don't despair. I know you're worried, don't despair. Soon we will make an announcement that will awe and shock the world and inspire the world. It doesn't say what that announcement is. I think it could be one of two things. One, they, they're going to say the Messiah has returned, uh, the 12th Imam has returned. Absent that, it's a nuclear uh, issue. So uh, to me, right now, Europe seems to be moving exactly in the direction of recognizing that the nuclear cat is out of the bag. And this is an incorrigible, undependable, unreliable regime. For the last few days, few weeks, they have arrested several new Europeans to use as hostages. They have used, they have arrested French, they have arrested an Italian, uh, and Europeans are recognizing this. And uh, a change of place seems to have uh, uh, taken uh, root here. Uh, during the Bush administration, during certainly the Trump administration, uh, Europe was much more uh, for a path of reconciliation with Iran. Let's negotiate with them. Let's give them the concessions. We'll keep the nuclear deal contained. Now, Europe is much, I think, ahead of uh, uh, the United States. Uh, Macron uh, just met with a group of Iranian women. Uh, foreign ministry of uh, France met with uh, uh, some of Iranian dissidents. Uh, Schultz, the, the chancellor, directly talked to the regime. So what kind of a regime are, what kind of people are you to shoot at your people? So uh, I think the Biden administration, uh, maybe under the influence of Mr. Robert Mali, still thinks that it can salvage a deal. Uh, and I think that at this moment is both foolish policy and uh, morally uh, suspect. So, so it, in that spectrum from obviously non-interference in a country's domestic affairs to, you know, the, the, the signaling that, that can be done, um, what would you like to see the U.S. doing in, in particular, right? So stronger signaling, um, backing away from, you know, any overtures for a deal, um, you know, is it is it talking with with people and just saying we've got your back? Is it public announcements or, or or is there something more tangible? You know, particularly given the fact that there's this this nuclear issue as well. No, I, I think uh, more clear, unambiguous messages to the people of Iran that we have your back. Clear and unambiguous messages to the regime 
that we are watching. And if you continue this, there will be price to be paid. Have no doubt. I can give you a specific example. When the international community has spoken with one clear voice, the regime has backed off its brutality. They literally stopped, literally stopped stoning women in Iran because there was a concentrated uh, international force. Uh, Meisami, Farhad Meisami was on, the death, on his deathbed because he had uh, gone on a hunger strike. They have put this man in prison now for seven years because he defended the right of women to decide their own. This is a brilliant guy. He went on a hunger strike and the U.S. international community, everybody said, if this guy dies, you are gonna pay a price. And they uh, succumbed to some of his wishes. Uh, three days ago, uh, a gentleman called Hosseini Ronari, a remarkable guy. Just, I mean, truly, if I, we don't have time, if I tell you the story of what this man has done in the last few weeks, you, you think it's, uh, a fairy tale or it's a myth, but they arrested him, they brutalized him, tortured him, broke his hand, broke his feet, literally. Uh, and he went on a hunger strike. And uh, word got out, uh, two of Iran's best directors who are in prison, uh, Panahi and Rasulov, issued a statement that this guy is about to die. And there was an international outcry. And the regime today, this morning, issued a picture of him with his mother looking like he is on the verge of recovery. If there was no international outcry, I think Ronaldi would have been dead. So that kind of a concentrated and more pressure on the regime. Every element of this regime who has accounts in Western banks, who have interest in this country, who run uh, institutions that are de facto places for propagation of that regime's ideology and prop and de facto peddlers of the regime, they should be called in for reckoning. Uh, the regime has culture, Islamic centers in Germany. Germany just closed one of them because they knew this is not a place for worship. Places of worship should be respected. Islam should have as much right as Judaism, as Christianity, as Buddhism, as devil worshipers to have their place of worship in this country. But you cannot use that place of worship as the Iranian regime does for espionage, for spying on Iranians, and for propagating anti-Semitism, anti-rationalism, and uh, despotism. Thank you. Um... I I'd love to try to get another question in before we turn to the Q&A box. Um, for those of you who are listening, if you have a question, please feel free to put it in the Q&A box at any time. Um, I do want to talk about, uh, you know, we talked a little bit about the U.S. and Europe in regards to Iran. Um, I'd love to talk about Iran's neighbors. Um, you know, what, what, what are you observing in terms of their calculations and what do you think that they should be keeping in mind regarding the future of um, Iran? Because any, any changes there would obviously have you know, widespread impact across the region too. Well, the, uh, uh, of Iran's neighbors, some of the most, uh, at least three of the most important, uh, Israel is not a neighbor, but it's a virtual neighbor because Iran has so many forces in Lebanon and Syria that Iran and Israel have become a virtual uh, de facto uh, neighbors. Uh, Saudi Arabia clearly uh, is, I think, uh, angered at US policy. Uh, they, they think the Biden administration has been too close, too cozy with this regime. Uh, and they have shown it. They have shown it in their oil policy. They have shown it in their cozying up to China. They have shown it in their cozying up to, uh, to Russia. Uh, I mean, a major shift in the region is happening under our very eyes. Uh, the United States is giving its place of prominence to China and to Russia, primarily China. Uh, and uh, they, Saudi Arabia, is very active in forming new alliances, uh, in thinking about uh, what the landscape looks like absent the United States. Uh, I think, um, Maybe the biggest winner of all of this is Israel. Uh, Israel has, is now in a, a better position in the region, has more alliances, has more diplomatic relations, has more flights, has more possibilities of investment, has more 
uh, intelligence operations around Iran's neighborhood than ever before. Uh, so uh, I, I think the, the failure of the Iranian regime uh, is that uh, it has created a lot of enemies and its only allies are the ones uh, they literally have bought. Hezbollah, the Houthis, Assad, and half of the Iraqi Shiites, not even all of the Iraqi Shiites. Uh, again, it's very important. Ayatollah Sistani is now clearly the highest authority in Shiism in the world, and clearly the most influential Shiite in Iraq. He has a representative in Iran. This is his son-in-law. And this is a guy who collects money as uh, people pay money to the Ayatollahs. He is the collector of Ayatollahs' money. He issued a statement four days ago that these demonstrations are a bunch of hooligans. Ayatollah Sistani, two days later, said, I have no political representative in Iran, and he has no right to speak on my behalf. That's as good as saying, I support this movement, and I don't like this regime. So even the Shiites in Iraq are uh, torn uh, uh, in, in terms of uh, where they stand. That's a, a, that, that's a very interesting and <laughs> I think hard place to be for, for the Iranian government, um, which, which actually segues nicely into some of the questions that I'm getting in the Q&A box. And again, if you have a question, please feel free to ask it. And I know that um, oftentimes speakers don't like to speculate on things, but um, you mentioned these lack of ties across the region. Um, and obviously whatever happens with Iran and, and, and it's, it's, it's hard to say what will, although as you said, it's, you know, it, it's sort of a corpse of a government at this point, but um, you know, what, what would come next? And we have a couple of questions that I'll, I'll try to kind of weave, weave these points in. Um, you know, uh, we have someone asking about the rhetoric of returning the monarchy in Iran, and how do you analyze that? L fewer than 3 million follow Prince Reza Pahlavi, uh, Pal Pahlavi on Instagram. And again, Instagram is not the best measure of things, but you have an activist like uh, Ali Karimi is followed by more than 14 million. And so, you know, people are curious about what in theory could come next as a, as a potential structure and, and leader. Uh, uh, you know, first of all, uh, I think uh, Mr. Reza Pahlavi has been a, a reluctant uh, player in all of this. Uh, he uh, keeps appearing and then disappearing. Uh, people haven't seen a persistent effort on his behalf, I think. Uh, uh, and other people have emerged. Uh, Karimi has 14 million. There is a rapper that has maybe 10 million followers. Uh, there are a number of people who have a lot of followers. Uh, uh, there is a, a singer um, called Homeira uh, from the Ancien Regime. Uh, if you go and click on some of her songs, uh, have 40 million downloads, 40 million. That's more than the total downloads of all the sermons of all the clergy in Iran in the last 44 years. Uh, so clearly there is a disharmony between the regime and the society. Uh, what I think will come in Iran uh, in the midterm, not in the short term, uh, is a secular democratic government because that's what people want. And that's the only thing, that's the only thing that is going to save Iran. Because Iran, because of this regime's mismanagement of the economy, because of its uh, reluctance to enter into the gas markets in Europe, because of the way it has mishandled even the oil, because of the way it has uh, mishandled Iran's uh, uh, intellectual capital, the flight of Iranian intellectuals, engineers, doctors. Iran has been in the last 10 years often one of the top countries in the brain drain. Uh, so. Uh, Iran has disgruntled ethnic minorities. Uh, Iran has a very rich diaspora that can help fill the gaps that this regime has created. All of this will come together as a solution for, in a democracy. So in the midterm, I see nothing other than democracy because it is needed 
historically, economically, socially, and I think it's the desire of the ex majority of the people. Whether it is a return of the monarchy, I don't see it that likely, but I, I can predict. Uh, Mr. Reza Pahlavi, to his credit, has said that uh, uh, he, he's not in favor of reviving the monarchy. He has said very clearly that uh, he wants a republic and uh, he might stand for office, uh, which I suspect does not mean standing for the office of a uh, uh, king. Uh, so uh, the trend lines, uh, you know, uh, social science uh, does not. Uh, uh, predict, but it has the ability, I think, to see where society is moving. It sees the patterns, it sees the trend line. The trend line to me is towards a democracy. The most immediate possible consequence, uh, I think, is a short term military dictatorship by the IRGC. Uh, if this continues, they're going to think that the only way they can save the regime is. Uh, uh, now, th there are there is activities in Iran by the Iranian reformists uh, who are trying to say, bring us back into the fold. We can save this for you. We still have the capacity to, to do it. But I don't think that the, uh, that moment is any longer on the horizon. Uh, that moment was on the horizon when you went to Iran, for example. If in 2014, Mr. Khomeini was less aggressive, less ambitious, less dogmatic, less uh, uh, hungry for power and had al allowed. If in 2009, he had allowed the person who I think won the election, Mr. Musavi, Iran would be a different place. But Musavi is in prison and Khamenei is in the prison of his own uh, delusions. I have two great questions in the Q&A box that are that are good follow ups to this, um, but I'll, I'll do one of them first and then hopefully I can segue back to the other. So one person writes, um, how would you describe the IRGC to an American audience and was the killing of Qasem Soleimani illegal and should someone be held accountable referring to um, Qasem Soleimani who was um, killed right, what was it January it was January 2nd or 3rd of um, 2021, right before we got overtaken by the January 6th events yeah. here. Yeah. Uh, the IRGC uh, stands for Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps. What is very uh, revealing about its title is that the word Iran does not appear in it. Uh, it's not the Iranian uh, Revolutionary Guard Corps, mm -hmm. not the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps of Iran, it's the Islamic Revolutionary Guard. And it is uh, an, a tool of the expansion of this regime's ideology globally. Uh, and it has become increasingly involved in nefarious acts, both inside Iran and outside Iran. Outside Iran, through the Quds Brigade uh, that Mr. Ghassem Soleimani led and essentially created almost out of. Uh, it now, uh, IRGC now, has credibly reported uh, control of at least 50% of the economy. Yeah. <laughs> Almost all of the lucrative uh, businesses <laughs> in every domain is controlled directly either by an IRGC company or an IRGC commander now retired or a joint private uh, <laughs> public company. So they have become a corporatist entity rather than an ideological. <laughs> Uh, and in my view, they now have far more power than Mr. Khamenei. The IRGC without Khamenei is the IRGC. Khamenei without the IRGC, it will be run out of the country in um, almost a day. The level of uh, vitriol against them, uh, the kinds of uh, slogans that are now uh, regularly written on the walls or put in songs, put in rappers' uh, music uh, is just remarkable. So uh, to me, the IRGC began essentially as the guards for the regime elite, gradually morphed into a military parallel to the Iranian traditional military that the Iranian regime from Khomeini to Khomeini never trusted. They thought it has the possibility, the proclivity to become a monarchist. So. Uh, Contrary to, for example, the US 
in Iraq, which immediately dismantled the Iraqi military and created for itself an enormous problem. Khomeini did not dismantle the military. It decapitated it. It killed or exiled or imprisoned all the generals or retired all the generals. It promoted its own forces, but then more importantly, it created a parallel military. And the war with Iraq was the occasion for this initially small unit to morph into even bigger than the Iranian military. It now has its own Navy. It has its own Air Force. It has its own space program. It has its own intelligence program. It has enormous economic uh, juggernaut. Uh, and I, I think they will be calling the shots in, in the next uh, moment of a transition. Uh, the killing of uh, Qasem Soleimani to me by every account that I know, uh, every law that I know was an illegal act. Uh, and it was an, uh, essentially taking a step that could have uh, uh, brought the two countries in, in, into a virtual war. Uh, but it also, uh, having said this, it also weakened the regime in ways that I think no other act maybe has done. Uh, the Quds Brigade has now become a hollowed shell of what it was. Uh, and in this moment today, if Qasem Soleimani was alive, he would be able to cohere the IRGC into a much more viable option uh, for su succeeding this regime. Uh, his absence, uh, I think, and the fact that he has now become the subject of fury. Uh, people are burning his statue, they're burning his uh, images, there are slogans against him. More and more has become known about his role in the suppression of the Iranian student movement, uh, his role in writing a letter threatening Khamenei, Khatami with a coup. Uh, his popularity has shrunk and uh, the uh, ritual against them uh, or the anger against them has increased. I just want to say thank you. I just want to stay on the IRGC for a moment. Um, you mentioned that they're over 50% of the economy um, and control, you know, so much of the, the big companies, corporations. Um, how does this play into sanctions? So, you know, I'm very curious to understand, you know, as, you know, the U.S. and European allies apply more pressure sanction-wise, how does that affect the IRGC's own um, economic strength? And is there is there a, a risk in, in that that's, you know, not being taken into account? Well, I think uh, the way the IRGC uh, has uh, used uh, the sanctions to enrich itself uh, is well known. Uh, at least one uh, last past president and past candidate for presidency, Mr. Ahmadinejad and Mr. Karubi, are on record saying that the IRGC, the IRGC is the chief uh, smuggler in Iran. And they are in, involved in smuggling everything from alcohol to opium to television to iPads, everything. Everything is available in Iran but it's at a very high price, much higher price. And they, I think, clearly are the biggest uh, smugglers. Uh, and in, in that sense, they have uh, uh, enriched themselves. And that's why uh, many people in Iran, many, including uh, Mr. Jawad Zarif, uh, the one-time foreign minister that you might have met in the trip you went to Iran. Uh, Basically, he says that the IRGC was uh, not in favor of the end uh, of sanctions, uh, that they weren't in favor of uh, the nuclear deal. He said three, three forces were against the nuclear deal being uh, accepted. The IRGC was the most important domestic one. Russia and China, he said, also didn't want this because Russia and China also wanted a weakened Iran dependent on China and Russia. And every time there was a possibility of breaking their uh, hegemonic position, they did something that would uh, disrupt. 
Thank you. Um, going back to one of our earlier questions, uh, we have the, the, a great question in the queue from someone who asks, if the movement towards democracy is incremental, it would be good to understand the profile of those who would be sympathetic to having a secular democratic regime with equal rights for all, women and minorities in particular. To what extent is this a women's movement with some smaller percentage of male support? And are women taking part in the protests from educated urban backgrounds? Have they made inroads among the less educated? What about generational differences? I think that's a uh, great question. Uh, I, I think uh, right now, in, in my view, uh, the leadership of this democratic movement is, uh, are the women of Iran uh, for two reasons. Uh, if you look back historically over the last 30, 40 years, the Iranian regime has tried to create uh, a virtual reign of terror, basically telling people there is nothing you can do to dislodge us. We are here to stay. And some uh, peddlers of the Iranian regime in the US uh, and in Europe also said the same thing. They said, this is the 1,000 year right, and the only thing you can do is negotiate with them. Uh, and the first and foremost chink in that armor the first and foremost uh, force that showed that this regime can be forced to change was the women's movement. The women's movement that began fighting for every inch of uh, the scarf, for every right. You know, when this regime came to power, the first law they changed was the family law under the Shah that was beginning to give women some rights. It made polygamy illegal. It made this business of concubinage where men can have as many lovers if they uh, recite a Quranic verse to them as they want. I mean, it's virtual legalized prostitution. Uh, it changed that. Khomeini, first law, the first law they changed was that because they wanted to stop the rise of women. They were afraid of assertive women, but women fought and they showed that they can force this regime. I, I've often said this, that I think after the civil rights movement in this country, the most substantial, consequential, uh, successful movement of civil disobedience has been organized by Iranian women over the last 30 years, not accepting illegal laws, not accepting the hegemony of. So to me, that is a critical aspect of this democratic movement. And to me, it's a sign of its maturity. Uh, it's a sign of a democratic maturity where the slogan of a movement becomes woman, life, and liberty. To me, uh, it's more progressive than life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Uh, because it says, it recognizes you cannot have life, you cannot have liberty, you cannot have pursuit of happiness unless you accept the absolute equality of woman. That is today, in my view, in 21st century, the measure of democracy. And you have in Iran, a democratic movement that has this wisdom, that has come to this recognition that unless women are treated as equal, and are afforded every right that a man has. And a woman of every ethnic persuasion, every religion, then you can't have democracy. Uh, now, the unveiling of women, again, the question is a very insightful question because it used to be said that veiling is a question of uh, the petty bourgeois. This is a rich woman's uh, concern when the first demonstrations against forced hijab happened in Iran in 1980, 81. Many of the leftists, many of the Democrats, the secular Democrats and all of the clergy said, oh, these are Westernized uh, ideas. Iranian women don't care about these things. Even some journalists, I saw clips, American journalists said, oh yeah, woman, uh, Iranian women don't care. This is just an upper middle class. It's no longer an upper middle class. Uh, a woman of um, 80 odd years old 
all her life has worn a hijab. The regime killed her son because he had a, a social media account that had 70, 70 readers. They killed him under torture. I've written about him in the, an article in New Republic. I went and read all of his sightings. First, with 70 leaders, they wanted to kill this person to make fear for everybody. That woman, her, his mother, Miss Gohari Ashki, has now become a kind of a Greek mythological uh, hero. One of these uh, women in mythology that is going to demand the righteous barrier of his son or her. She went on in front of a camera and took off her veil in sympathy with the woman in the streets. Uh, you have to understand Iranian culture to understand how dramatic that is for that woman. Uh, I've said this several times in my class. My grandmother, when there was forced unveiling in Iran, never left the house for five years. She said, I can't imagine. It's like going outside naked. Wow. Wow. Um, we, we do have, um, we have about 10 minutes left, a little less, so I want to try to get in a few questions. I am getting a few questions on the, the nuclear issue, so I'll try to combine them. Um, there, there's one person who asks, you know, a couple of people are wanting, wanting to understand, you know, how, how do you deal with Iran's nuclear program at this point? Um, you know, is there any glimmer of hope to revive the JCPOA? And if Iran gets a nuclear weapon, what will be the impact on others in the Middle East, particularly Israel and Saudi Arabia? Uh, first of all, my, my apologies uh, to those who have asked questions. I give long answers and I uh, get to ask less questions. So accept my apology. Uh, I try to be brief so we can get to more. Uh, <clears throat> uh, the reason I think uh, uh, the nuclear deal can't be revived is that I think the Iranian regime, first of all, has uh, made much, much more research in the past about the military component of the program than it has admitted. The documents that Israel stole from Iran uh, and took to Israel and has now made available to some scholars clearly seems to indicate that they had made much, much more uh, developed inroads into finding the necessary technologies, the necessary equipment for making a bomb. Uh, as we speak, there is an ex-CIA agent serving time in prison in the United States for the divulging that the United States sold a faulty design for a nuclear bomb to Iran. The fact that poor uh, or guilty, I don't know, the gentleman is serving time is one aspect of this. But the fact that Iran was in the market uh, 15 years ago for a design seems to fly in the face of everything Mr. Zarif and regime uh, peddlers have said in this country for 20 years, that the regime never had a military component. This is against our faith, blah, blah, blah. Yada, yada, yada. None of that now holds true. So the deal is no longer, uh, the reality we know about Iran is no longer the reality of 2015. Uh, I think the only thing that is holding the regime back, this, I'm just giving you my reading of it, uh, is that I think China and Russia, who are the only countries that have some leverage with this regime right now, uh, do not want uh, Iran to have a bomb for different reasons. Uh, China is now much closer to Saudi Arabia than it is to Iran. And Saudi Arabia clearly doesn't want Iran to have a bomb, although it can have a bomb very quickly. It can buy a bomb almost overnight. And in a sense, it has bought some bombs because Pakistan has offered uh, deterrence to Saudi Arabia. So uh, uh, to me, uh, the only, I have written about this for almost 10 years, 20 years, that the only serious strategic solution to Iran's nuclear problem is a democratic Iran. Unless you have a democratic Iran, no one, Israel, Saudi Arabia, Turkey, uh, Europe, United States, is going to trust 
that this regime will handle the bomb uh, carefully. Now, what? why does this regime want the bomb? Uh, I, well, I completely understand that you would be worried in Israel if somebody is sitting in Israel, uh, that this regime might uh, use it. But I don't think it's intended to be used uh, in that capacity. It is intended to be used as a deterrence against the people of Iran. The bomb is more than anything else intended to tell the Iranian people, we are impervious to outside pressure. Nobody is going to come to your help because now we have the capacity to wreak havoc. So, uh, but it will, I think, in spite of what I say, I think if the regime declares that it has a bomb, uh, next week, Saudi Arabia is going to have a bomb and Turkey is going to have, and Egypt is going to have, United Arab Emirates is going to have. Yes, that's a d domino effect. Um, I think I will ask one more question uh, from one of our viewers. Um, and he asks, is there any possible prospect of a future that people can hold on to, even temporarily or perhaps wrongly, a roadmap that shows a light at the end of this dark tunnel? Oh, absolutely. Uh, if I don't believe that there was that light at the end of the dark, dark tunnel, I would have uh, probably committed suicide many, many years ago. There is light at the end of this tunnel. I think the light is becoming brighter every day. I have to say that many people think that I am a foolishly optimistic. Uh, they have literally said this. Uh, some ex-CIA uh, agent told the Stanford uh, magazine that I'm a foolish optimist. Uh, uh, I am an optimist. I absolutely believe. I honestly tell you this, it's not a rhetorical answer to a very good question, uh, but Iran is the most likely country to be the most democratic Islamic country very soon in the region. Iran is the only country that has launched a, a democratic movement against an Islamic state. Uh, Iran, by every measure, is today more secular more democratic, more firmly of the belief, not everybody, but a great majority, that you must keep religion and state separate. You must respect religion as a private aspect than anyone else in Europe. There is no place, there is no place in Islamic society where you have a woman's movement as powerful, as pervasive, as prudent as Iran. For all of these reasons, and Iran has a remarkably rich diaspora that is very, very much invested in trying to make a better Iran. All of these give me great hope. And occasional conversations like this give me great hope that there is light at the end of the tunnel. Well, that is a very good place to end. Um, Professor Malani, thank you so much for your words of optimism. Um, I, you know, I'm curious to see what, what, what comes. Um, and, and thank you very much for putting so much of um, what, we're, what we're reading about in context. Um, I really appreciate it. Thank you to the audience. There were really terrific questions. I'm sorry I could not get to them all. Uh, we do have some upcoming briefings. Our next one is on Wednesday and it will be about um, water insecurity. So please do tune in. Um, that's Wednesday at noon. And I think Brian put the link in the chat. Um, and then as well, you know, to everyone who is um, listening, you know, we are a nonprofit. Um, we do rely on donations. We're trying to keep these conversations free and open to everyone around the world. So if you can, please do donate. We would greatly appreciate it. Um, and with that, Professor Milani, thank you so much for your work and for joining us today. It was a real honor. Thank you. And again, apologies to those who asked questions. And because of my long answers, we didn't get to them. Thank you very much. Thank you. Have a good one. Bye-bye.